Hi everyone, uh, good evening. We'll start in another two minutes. We'll wait for everyone to join. So I'm only seeing the three of us. Yeah, so it's in the webinar format. You won't be able to see everyone, but oh, they'll okay. be, yeah, yeah. All right, but they're there. <laughs> yeah, they're all there and they can communicate with you through chat. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we'll start now. Good evening, everyone. The Ashoka University Economic Society welcomes you to today's webinar on economics, comedy, and climate change. We are here today with Mr. Yoram Bauman, who makes a living as the world's first and only stand-up economist. But he's also a PhD environmental economist who founded Carbon Washington, which in 2016 placed the first ever carbon tax measure on the ballot in the United States. He also takes his comedy act to colleges and corporate events around the world. His goals in life are to spread joy to the world through economics comedy, to reform economics education, and to implement carbon pricing. Today, Mr. Bauman will share insights from his career as the world's first and only stand-up economist, and from his efforts to implement pocketbook-friendly climate policies, including a possible research policy idea for India. To the audience, please send any questions that you may have for Mr. Bauman during the webinar in the Q&A box 
so that he answers them during the Q&A session of the webinar. I would now like to welcome Mr. Bauman to deliver his talk. Over to you, Sohi. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, good evening. I'm here in Salt Lake City. Uh, so good morning from Salt Lake City. It's a pleasure to be with you all. My name is Yaron Bauman. I uh, do appear before you today as the world's first and only stand-up economist. I really only have one thing going for me as a stand-up economist and that's low expectations. Um, I'll tell you the first joke I ever told on stage, which was that when I told my father that I was going to be a stand-up economist, he said, Yaron, he said, you can't be a stand-up economist. And I said, why not? And he said, because there's no demand. I said, don't worry, dad, I'm a supply side economist. I just stand up and let the jokes trickle down. I believe in the Laffer curve. It's uh, just a, some economics jokes for you. Uh, it's a little hard to do comedy when you can't hear everybody on the other side, but I hope you're enjoying this. I will tell a few jokes and then talk more seriously about uh, about some climate change things I'm working on, and maybe uh, we'll do some q and I can tell you about the world of stand-up comedy if you're interested. Uh, but I want to start by showing you my T-shirt. This is my uh, this is my my enjoy capitalism T-shirt. So I'm made in China. If you look at the tag on the back, it's actually made out of 80% cotton and 20% irony. It's uh, dry, clean only. Uh, Many people think it's unusual that I make a living. And by the way, I have made a living over the last 15 years doing stand-up comedy about economics, mostly at colleges and corporate events. I've done some shows in, in uh, Asia. I have not been to India, although I would love to come. Um, when people ask me, you know, after my talks, usually the first question that I get is, what do you really do for a living? Uh, no, no, I really do stand-up comedy about economics for a living. Um, I occasionally do some teaching and some consulting work, uh, but mostly comedy pays the bills. Uh, people think that that's a little unusual, as if stand-up comedy and economics don't have very much in common. Um, but I want to share with you the first ever uh, the the video that I that I did the 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 presentation that I did that kind of got me into stand-up comedy. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. All right. So this is a. Uh, this is Mankiw's Principles of Economics translated. So for those of you uh, who don't know Greg Mankiw, Harvard professor, wrote one of the best-selling economics textbooks in the world. Uh, and it's based on these 10 principles of economics. You may be familiar with that. If not, it's okay. I know there's a lot of words on the screen, but just take my words. You pretty much need a PhD in economics to understand these 10 principles. Now, fortunately, I have a PhD in economics. So I've taken it upon myself to translate these principles for the rest of humanity. We're gonna begin by separating them into the first seven principles, which are microeconomics, and the last three, which are macroeconomics. The difference, as PJ O'Rourke once said, being that microeconomists are wrong about little things and macroeconomists are wrong about things in general. Uh, we're gonna begin with the macro principles eight, nine, and 10. Now, believe it or not, these all have the exact same translation, namely blah, blah, blah. As proof, I need only remind you that macroeconomists have successfully predicted nine out of the last five recessions. And as further proof, we can now go up one font size. So let's go back to the micro principles. Now, the first one here, people face trade-offs. This is really one of the most fundamental ideas in economics and the translation is very simple, right? Choices are bad. This is a simple syllogism. Trade-offs are bad. Anytime you have choices, you have trade-offs. Therefore, choices have to be bad. If you don't understand that, take a look at the second principle. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. Translation, choices are really bad. Now, I have a simple little demonstration of this fact that will blow your mind. Imagine that someone offers you a Snickers bar hey, that you value at a dollar. All right, then what you can loosely think of as your economic profit in this situation is the dollar of the Snickers bar minus the cost which you give up to get it, which is nothing, your economic profit is a dollar. Now, to begin to understand why choices are bad, imagine that someone offers you a choice between the Snickers bar that you value at a dollar and some M&Ms that you value at 70 cents. Okay, now your economic profit is the dollar minus the 70 cents, only 30 cents. You begin to understand 
why choices are bad. The worst possible situation, in fact, is being offered a choice between a Snickers bar and an identical Snickers bar, because then your economic profit is zero. All right, now people who are not trained in economics might say that that's no different than just being offered one Snickers bar, but that kind of sloppy thinking will never get you a tenure track position. Sometimes I get faculty members who email me and they're like, that thing with the Snickers bar is great. I'm gonna put it on the final exam and have the students explain what's wrong with it. And then they always email me back a week later and say that they didn't do it because they couldn't figure out the answer. There is no good answer. Choices are bad. Choices are really bad. I'm not gonna beat around the bush with you folks. If you don't understand why choices are bad, you're probably stupid. Moving on, principle number three, rational people think at the margin. Translation, people are stupid. Now it is immediately obvious that people do not think at the margin. Nobody goes to the grocery store and says, I'm gonna buy an orange. I'm gonna buy another orange. I'm gonna buy another orange. That joke only makes sense to econ majors. People don't think like that. Right? But if people don't think at the margin, and if as Professor Mankiw says, rational people do think at the margin, we are led to a most unhappy conclusion. People are not rational. People, in other words, are stupid. But before you despair for humanity, take a look at the next principle, people respond to incentives. Now the dictionary says that incentive is a noun and that it's a synonym for motive. So when Professor Mankiw says that people respond to incentives, what he's saying is that people are motivated by motives. You may think this is a bit like saying that tautologies are tautological, right? I mean, people would have to be pretty stupid to be unmotivated by motives. But remember principle three, people are stupid. Hence the need for principle four to tell us that people aren't that stupid. All right, moving on to every economist's favorite topic, free trade. Principle five, trade can make everyone better off. Translation, trade can make everyone worse off. Now you may wonder how the translation of principle five is the opposite of the principle itself. I have a simple proof of this fact that will blow your mind. I want you to compare two statements. One of them is trade can make everyone better off. And the other one is trade will make everyone better off. Now, if you had to pick one of those two statements to put in your best-selling economics textbook, right? It's no contest. The second statement is clearly stronger, better. But Professor Mankiw uses the first statement instead. And if you think about why, there's only one possible explanation. The second statement has got to be wrong. In other words, trade can make some people worse off. And from there, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to trade can make everyone worse off. Now, I figured some of you would have some questions about this, so I added a footnote with some details. Eat your heart out. Now that we've cleared that up, I want you to see the last two principles. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Translation, governments are stupid. And governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Translation, governments aren't that stupid. Follow immediately for principle five and its translation. Right, if trade can make everyone better off, what do we need government for? Right, I'll just let people trade. Governments are stupid. But if trade can make everyone worse off, well, we better have a government around to stop people from trading. So there are the 10 principles of economics translated. Much better than what we started with, I hope you'll agree. So I've uh, performed this and filmed it a couple of years ago, put a video up on my website, standupeconomist.com, and on YouTube, not thinking all that much of it. And I'm a little embarrassed to say that it's now well over a million hits on YouTube, which is a lot for economics jokes, right? Not necessarily a lot for videos about puppies, but it's a lot for economics jokes. And many of those hits are because the video was posted on Greg Mankiw's blog. It turns out that he's a fan of my parody. Either that or else he comes from the school of there's no such thing as bad publicity. Uh, in any case, one of the great things about YouTube is that not only do a lot of people waste a lot of time looking at videos on YouTube, a significant fraction of those people waste even more time commenting on videos on YouTube. And I wanna share with you some of my favorites because these are actually funnier than the video itself now. Starting with someone with the screen name of Coolway and Coolway writes, I can't tell whether this video is supposed to be funny or educational. Choices are bad. Uh, runner up, you're funny. And I don't say that to a lot of people. Lots of people are not funny. Lots of people are sad. Um, I like to think I'm doing something new in the world by doing stand up comedy about economics. Apparently, not. The next person writes a Jew who's an economist and a stand up comedian. You can't get any more stereotypical than that. 
<laughs> Every time I see this, I'm reminded of what my father actually said when I told him that I was going to do stand-up comedy. So what you need to know about my father, my father's first-generation American, uh, he's sort of divorced from popular culture like he's never owned a television. So when I told him I was going to do stand-up comedy, he said, Yoram, he said, be reasonable. You know, give me the name of a single Jew who's ever made it in stand-up comedy. Uh, the other thing this always reminds me of, I did a show a few years ago in Northern Michigan. It was at a resort. I spent the night. I had breakfast at the restaurant attached to the hotel. There was an item on the breakfast menu called the Lachaim breakfast bagel. And the Lachaim breakfast bagel in Thompsonville, Michigan came with your choice of smoked ham or crispy bacon. Uh, apparently no Jews in Northern Michigan. Uh, not everybody's a fan of the video. One person writes, the man in the video is the most stupid man in the world, which is extremely impressive given the competition. Uh, another person wrote, I spaced off listening to this just like in my real economics class. And then there are kind of the crazy people like the fellow who writes, they make economics boring and confusing on purpose because they don't want you to figure out that the whole economy is a Ponzi scheme. This person gets bonus points for creating a new word, uh, unpurpose, unpurpose. And this is not the craziest thing somebody wrote. The craziest thing somebody wrote was this. Uh, what a confusion of deceptions. The U.S. Congress does not print money as the Constitution dictates. That power was usurped by a cabal of international banksters in 1913. At first, I thought that banksters was a typo for bankers. And then my wife informed me that banksters equals bankers plus gangsters. This is the financial mafia. Right? You've got the Italian mafia. The Italian mafia stereotypically makes you offers that you can't refuse. And you've got the financial mafia. The financial mafia makes you offers that you can't understand. I finally understood that this person was talking about the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States created in 1913, but only because the next thing that they write is that the Federal Reserve is about as federal as Federal Express. Uh, I honestly have no idea what this means. Uh, but I'm pretty sure this fellow has lost a lot of money lately in crypto. Uh, in any case, after this person writes this nasty stuff about the Federal Reserve on my YouTube comments page, somebody else feels compelled to come to the defense of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States on my YouTube comments page. So here's what the next person writes, you know, in defense of the Fed, if we were, got rid of it, we'd still need to replace it with something that does its functions, i.e. printing money and clearing checks. The first of which the Fed doesn't actually do. The Treasury prints money, not the Fed. Clearing checks is a very minor role that the Fed has. So somebody else has to write in and correct this person and say, actually, the Fed doesn't print money. And this is a very good answer. The Fed controls the money supply, mostly by expanding and contracting bank reserves. And then the first person writes back in and says, oh, yeah, that's right. Thanks. So now we're getting like education on the YouTube comments page, which is always nice to see. Uh, not all exchanges are this nice. One person just writes in and says, translate. So somebody takes the bait and says, uh, says he's poking fun at microeconomics. And the first person writes back and says, yeah, but translate, you jerk. And the second person writes back and says, that was a translation. You should probably stick to entertaining yourself with less intellectually demanding material. Not the meanest exchange on YouTube. The meanest exchange on YouTube starts with somebody who writes, this video rules. By the way, I'm not an economist. I switched my major, which compels somebody else to write back and say, thanks for keeping us updated. Let us know when you drop out altogether and devote your life to smoking crack. <laughs> Kids these days. Uh, I want to, I've got more jokes that I will share with you later, but I want to be serious for a few minutes. I want to come back to this slide here because this example in this footnote is actually a real example. So economists, we spend a lot of time talking about how trade can make lots of people, sometimes everybody better off, but it's actually possible, at least in a theoretical scenario, to have a situation where trade makes everybody worse off. And since that relates to the work that I do when I do serious economics, I work on climate change and carbon taxes and things like that. I want to talk you through this example real quick. So I'm going to tell you a made up story about three people. We're just going to call them orange, pink, and blue. And orange, pink, and blue live in a small town. And the small town has an air pollution problem. So think Delhi, right? But with three people, because models are simplifications of reality. Okay, And each of these three people, they each have a garage that's full of stuff that they don't use. Okay, so now we're going to see some trades. So the story I'm going to tell you is that Orange is going to sell a lawnmower to Pink. And the story is that Orange is not using the lawnmower. 
She sells it to Pink for $100 and Pink would be willing to pay $200 for a lawnmower. Okay, so they each get $100 in value from that trade. Orange sells this lawnmower for $100 that she wasn't using. Pink would be willing to pay $200 for a lawnmower. She only has to pay $100, so she gets $100 in that benefits. The problem is, is that when Pink starts using the lawnmower that Orange wasn't using, lawnmowers create a little bit of air pollution. Maybe you can see some haze around this town. And like I said, made up economic story. Maybe we can monetize the impacts of this air pollution, like lost days of work in school and stuff like that. Maybe we can monetize those impacts at $80 per person, All right? Not just for orange and pink, but also for blue. So the impact on blue is what economists call a negative externality, right? Because blue is external to this trade between orange and pink. Okay, but note that orange and pink each get $20 in net benefits from this trade. They may not know about blue. They may not care about blue. So this trade could still make sense to them. All right, so now I'm gonna tell you a similar story about another trade. So pink is gonna sell a motorcycle to blue. Again, pink's not using the motorcycle. She sells it to blue for $100 and they each get $100 in value from that trade. Pink sells this motorcycle that she's not using for $100. Blue would be willing to pay $200 for a motorcycle. She only has to pay 100, so she gets $100 in that benefits. But again, when blue starts using the motorcycle, air pollution gets a little bit worse. Maybe an additional $80 in healthcare costs for everybody, right? And now you just complete the circle. Blue is gonna sell a chainsaw to orange. Don't ask why. They each get $100 in benefits, air pollution gets worse, another $80 in healthcare costs for everybody. Right? And now if you just add up any one of these columns, you see that after all three of those trades together, everybody ends up at minus 40. I do a lot of shows, shows at colleges and I get all sorts of answers to that question, like zero or minus 100. Uh, math is hard, minus 40. <laughs> So this is the tragedy of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma, if you're familiar with those ideas, right? And the economics here are that each person's trades are individually rational. If you ask any of these people if they wanna take back any of the trades that they made, they'll say no, because each trade they make leaves them $20 better off, right? But all together, the trades end up hurting everybody. If you wanna belabor the point and make a connection to climate change, you could you know, label the people, right? And this is in very broad strokes what economists are concerned about when it comes to climate change, right? So uh, I'll note here that India is not one of the countries on here. And that's mostly because uh, until fairly recently, India's had fairly low emissions, but certainly the, the, you know, the future in terms of carbon emissions is gonna be determined uh, you know, largely, I think in, in, in in China as well, but also in India and Africa and, and uh, uh, countries that are that are rapidly in, in, you know industrializing and becoming wealthier. Let me tell you everything I think you need to know about climate change, just a couple of slides. So first of all, we have this fact that carbon concentrations in the atmosphere are going up. Nobody doubts that this is primarily due to human activity, principally burning fossil fuels and deforestation. Then we have this theory that says that if carbon concentrations in the atmosphere go up, then global temperatures are gonna go up. This theory actually goes all the way back to this fellow, Arrhenius, who was a chemist in Sweden. And in 1896, he made the first estimate of how much global temperatures would eventually increase if we doubled CO2 in the atmosphere, which we're on track to do kind of the middle of this century. And his estimate from 1896, about five degrees Celsius, right, nine degrees Fahrenheit, is actually still pretty close to the range that climate scientists talk about today. The big difference between where he was then and where we are now is that he thought that climate change was going to be awesome because uh, he lived in Sweden, right? At a time when agriculture dominated the economy. And we tend to be a little more concerned these days about rising sea levels and ocean acidification and extreme weather events and things like this. In any case, we have been running this experiment on planet Earth for the last 150 years or so, and here are the results of the experiment. So the blue dots are measures of global average temperatures for individual years. The red bars are 10-year averages starting in the 1880s, going up to the 1970s, and then there's the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, the 2010s, the first couple years of this decade. Temperatures, I would argue, going up pretty much in line with the projections of climate science. If you happen to not buy into that, then I encourage you to join a bet that I made with a fellow economist about whether global temperatures would continue to increase. He thought that they were going to stay flat roughly at this level. 
Uh, the bed goes until 2030, but I'm, I'm killing them. Uh, bad for the planet, but in 2030, I'll get the check for 500 bucks. Uh, so the way that economists think about pollution problems like this is actually very simple. It's that the way to get less pollution is to make polluting expensive. Because yeah, when you make polluting expensive, you get market forces working to promote conservation, innovation, development of new technologies, all the things that I, at least as a fairly neoclassical economist, right? All the things that I love about capitalism, right? Whatever you think about capitalism, maybe you love capitalism, maybe you hate capitalism. We should be able to agree that capitalism is a very powerful force in the world. And I work on using that powerful force. How do we turn that powerful force to reducing carbon emissions? A um, couple of policy tools to talk about here, like a carbon tax or an auction cap and trade system. Right? But the point of those policy tools is to drive up the price of fossil fuels. Now, this is generally the part in my comedy talks where people stop laughing, right? Because it's hard to convince people that we should be paying more for gasoline and electricity and things like this. But there is a side benefit to these policies, you know, other than the main benefit of potentially saving the world, right? And the side benefit is that if you do these policies right, you generate a pile of revenue, okay? Government can do all sorts of things with that revenue. You probably have your own ideas about what the government can do with a pile of revenue. But the idea that I work on and talk to folks about is that we could be using most or all of that revenue to reduce or eliminate existing taxes. So it's called environmental tax reform or tax shifting or revenue neutral tax swaps. Right? The idea being that if we had higher taxes on things we want less of, like carbon emissions, then we could afford to have lower taxes on things we want more of, like jobs and income and savings and investment. Okay, and This is an idea that has support kind of from economists across the political spectrum. Um, and uh, what's interesting about it, it was an idea that I came across when I was an undergraduate. I remember thinking that it was kind of an intellectually beautiful idea, right? Like higher taxes on bad things, lower taxes on good things. And I remember thinking that maybe it was an idea that could actually work in the real world. And uh, so I've ended up spending a considerable portion of my life energy trying to actually take this idea out of the textbook and make it happen in the real world. Um, uh, so I'll tell you about a, a couple of uh, examples places that I've done a little bit of work or have succeeded at this, and then talk about an idea that might be a research topic in, uh, in India, if any of you are interested. So uh, one is the Canadian province of British Columbia. So the very Northwest corner of Canada, Canadian province of British Columbia actually implemented in 2008, a really great climate policy uh, implemented by a right of center government that said, look, we want to do something about climate change, but we want to be, you know, pocketbook friendly. We don't want to grow government. So they implemented a carbon tax. Went up to about $30 per ton of CO2, uh, which is a pretty decent level for a, a carbon tax in terms of providing incentives for people to reduce emissions. But then they balanced that carbon tax. In fact, they more than balanced it by a little bit with reductions in existing taxes. So they cut personal income taxes and business taxes and taxes for low income households. So I would argue a really smart policy. And the evidence since the policy went into effect is that it has uh, pushed emissions reductions down and, or excuse me, has pushed emissions down. And, uh, and the economy of British Columbia is, is doing fine. You know, it has not fallen into the Pacific Ocean. So at the time, I was living in Washington State and kind of inspired in part by the BC carbon tax. Uh, I was the founder and co-chair of the first ever carbon tax ballot measure in the United States. This was the Initiative 732 campaign in Washington State. And our policy was pretty simple, right? It was pretty similar to what they had in BC. So we're going to have a carbon tax that's going to provide a financial incentive for everybody, individuals, households, businesses, utilities to reduce emissions. And then we're going to offset that tax increase with reductions in other taxes. So principally a reduction in the state sales tax, but there was also a tax cut for low-income working families. And there was a tax cut for manufacturers to make sure that they could stay competitive with businesses outside of the state, right? If you have a steel mill inside Washington state and they have to pay the carbon tax, then you need to do something to make sure that they can compete with steel mills um, you know, in California or Mexico or China or India. Uh, so we had a tax cut for manufacturers to, to try to do that. Uh, that policy, we made the ballot. So we gathered 250,000 signatures from voters in Washington state and made the ballot in 2016. Uh, we ended up losing. 
for reasons that I, I'm happy to go into during the Q&A if you're interested, but my summary of it uh, is that we lost because of opposition from folks on the right who were afraid that our policy was socialism and opposition from folks on the left who were mad that it wasn't. So there were folks on the right who, you know, aren't excited about climate action or, you know, carbon taxes. And then there were folks on the left who sort of wanted the, the Green New Deal, right? Like they wanted the kind of the revenue from the carbon tax, but they wanted it for government programs instead of offsetting tax cuts. Um, this was, you know, roughly 10 years of my life. This was a big deal, this campaign and losing was painful. Um, especially with opposition from the, you know, the environmental left. So a bunch of environmental groups uh, on the left side of the political spectrum came out against us. Um, you can imagine responding in all kinds of different ways. I responded by moving to Utah, which is where my wife's family is. Um, and now that I'm here in Utah, I'm actually involved in a carbon tax ballot measure effort in Utah. Uh, so Utah is a pretty conservative state controlled by, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party. Um, but I think there is an opportunity for climate action in Utah, and it's largely because uh, Utah has some pretty bad local air pollution levels, probably not by Delhi standards, but by American standards. So here's a view of the Salt Lake Valley on a very nice day in January a few years ago. And then a couple, uh, you can see that the PM 2.5 levels were very low. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, we had an inversion and PM 2.5 levels were considerably higher. Uh, again, probably still an order of magnitude off of, of where some of the air pollution levels are in India, uh, but this is a big political issue in Utah, the air pollution, and it's a health issue and a you know an economy issue uh, with jobs because people don't want to move out here because of the air pollution. So I'm part of a group called Clean the Darn Air, uh, and we're trying to put a measure on the ballot here in Utah in 2024, and the basic idea is Utah is one of the few states that still has a sales tax on grocery store food. So we're going to eliminate the sales tax on grocery store food. We're going to put $100 million a year into programs to improve local air quality, $50 million a year into rural economies and parts of the state that are struggling economically and also in many cases don't have air pollution problems. And we're going to pay for it all with a modest carbon tax on the fossil fuels that contribute to local air pollution and global climate change. Uh, tell you about an idea that I'm working on in some other states also, and this is potentially the opportunity for uh, research in, in India, although, you know, in, in general, anything, you know, a carbon tax, the revenue from a carbon tax can go towards new programs, it can go to cut existing taxes. Um, it, you know, the, the basic idea is that it doesn't just disappear into a hole in the ground, right? Like you can do stuff with that revenue to make it a good policy and to make it a fair policy. So this is an idea that I've been working on in various US states that's only in the electricity sector. I'll give an example with Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has a, a gross receipts tax, which is basically like a sales tax on electricity. And what's weird about the, this is that, it, you know, the thing that's hard about carbon taxes is that they drive up the price of things like electricity and gasoline that people don't want to pay more for. Right? But Pennsylvania and Arizona and Georgia and many other US states have these other taxes that drive up the price of electricity, but without any environmental benefit, right? There's no environmental component to these taxes. So the first idea that I've been working on is what I call a climate action tax swap that says, hey, look, right now we have, this is the base price of electricity. Right now we have these taxes in Pennsylvania that drive up the price of electricity. Okay, so let's eliminate that tax on electricity, the gross receipts tax on electricity, and replace it with a carbon tax on electricity. Right, that could bring the price of electricity back up to the same level it was at before, but now the electric utilities would have an incentive to reduce emissions because they'd be paying a carbon tax instead of a gross receipts tax. Right, and the carbon tax they can, you know, they can avoid by reducing their emissions. So the second iteration of this idea, I think is even simpler. It's what I call a climate action tax cut. And that says, look, right now there's this gross receipts tax on electricity. Let's just lower the gross receipts tax rate for utilities that can reduce their carbon emissions, right? Ultimately, if you can achieve zero carbon emissions, then you pay zero gross receipts tax. So it accomplishes kind of the same thing as a carbon tax, but sort of without increasing prices for consumers which is kind of a neat little trick. 
Uh, and in the long run, of course, you're sunsetting carbon emissions in the electricity sector, and you're also sunsetting a very regressive tax, right? So taxes on electricity are, are even more regressive than taxes on grocery store food, meaning that as a percentage of income, low-income households pay more than higher-income households. So this is a research and act activism opportunity uh, for folks here in the States. I'm trying to get some people interested in that. Uh, but I think it might also be uh, an opportunity in, in India. Um, so... Uh, the question is whether states in India levy taxes on electricity, whether they're value-added taxes or sales taxes, gross receipts taxes, things like that. But are there taxes uh, levied on electricity in India that you could use as the basis for one of these policies, right? Like either the climate action tax swap, where you get rid of the existing tax and replace it with a carbon tax, or the climate action tax cut, where you just lower, say, the value-added tax on electricity in line with utility reductions in carbon emissions. Um, what I think I know is that nationally, there's no value-added tax on electricity in India, but I don't know what things look like uh, at the state level. So if you're interested in uh, exploring this as a research idea or a passion for your life's work, uh, I encourage you to look into it and feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to uh, happy to chat about it and, and, and explore this with you. Um, and uh, who knows, if you're interested in environmental economics, um, you know, maybe there's a way to, to, to uh, invite me and my family out for a year to, to, to teach environmental economics at the university and, uh, um, and spend some time in India and things like that. Uh, I will now go back to telling you jokes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, although I did this routine once for a very conservative crowd here in the United States. And this fellow came up to me at the end of my, of my talk and said that the stuff I said about climate change was the funniest part of my whole routine. Um, some of the comedy I do is part of what I like to think of as a renaissance in economics humor. The idea of a renaissance coming as a surprise to those of you who know that renaissance means rebirth and had no idea that there was ever a first birth of economics humor. But in fact, there was. It was kind of in the 70s and the early 80s. It included papers like Paul Krugman's Theory of Interstellar Trade. Uh, Krugman, of course, won the Nobel Prize for his work on trade theory. He's also a big science fiction fan. And uh, whatever you think about his politics, he's, a, he's an amazing writer. And this piece, which you can find on my website, standupeconomist.com or elsewhere, is really fabulous, The Theory of Interstellar Trade. Another paper from this time period uh, of economics humor was this paper, Life Among the Econ, by Axel Unpronounceable. Uh, I'll tell you about some more recent papers in the world of economics humor. So Japan's Phillips curve looks like Japan. So if you need a refresher on the Phillips curve, this was the idea that there's, um, at least in the short run, there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. You can have high inflation, low unemployment, or the opposite. But the idea was you're always somewhere along that Phillips curve line. This paper was written by a Canadian. Uh, and there's a link to the paper on the author's website. And the link on the author's website says the title of this paper is also the abstract and frankly, most of the text, which is something we should be aiming for in all economics papers, I think. Uh, the rest of the paper is taken up by this graph here. So let me just explain what's going on here. On the y-axis, we have the inflation rate in Japan between 1980 and 2005. On the x-axis, we have the unemployment rate. For ease of viewing, the author is going to rotate this around the y-axis. And then there's a map of Japan. Like extremely impressive research. Uh, other funny papers that I should mention include this one, uh, A Few Good Men, Surname Sharing Economist Co-Authors, written by Goodman, 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 and Goodman. And then uh, Willingness to Pay is a quite recent paper by three male economists. The abstract in this paper, we tackle the hairy problem of male pattern baldness. We survey balding men and elicit their willingness to pay to move from their current sad situation to a more plentiful one. Then we comb over the results. Uh, I should also mention this paper, which is an actual economics paper. Can financial innovation help to explain the reduced volatility of economic activity? A paper that was published in 2006, shortly before financial innovation led to the greatest increase in the volatility of economic activity since the Great Depression. You may think this bodes ill for the research that was done by these scholars, but it's okay. I have tracked down the abstract of this paper, and here's the abstract of this paper. Uh, no. No, it can't. Uh, I should mention that I've got a couple of cartoon books about economics that you can certainly find like on the Kindle, and maybe you can find hard copies. Um, so micro and macro uh, cartoon books about economics, and then uh, 
a cartoon book about calculus and uh, recently released in the second edition, a cartoon introduction to climate change. Uh, so all these books, I think, are sort of, you know, they're accessible to a, a wide range of ages. Uh, they're page notes online. And if you really want to dig into them, then there's a lot of good content in them. So uh, I encourage you to check those out. I'm happy to say some economists have said nice things about them. So Greg Mankey called my book a painless way to learn economics, which I thought was especially generous coming from Greg Mankiw, given what I said about his book. I mean, I really think the only thing that I could have done that would have been meaner to Greg Mankiw would have been to post something on my blog calling his book a painful way to learn economics, uh, which I didn't do. But uh, anyway, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm occasionally I'm on Twitter, at least for now, but without a blue check. And uh, uh, there's my email address. I don't do a whole lot of social media, uh, but if you're interested in this research idea for India, or if you wanna invite me out to campus or whatever, then uh, feel free to drop me a line. I also have email lists. You can sign up for email lists on my website, standupeconomist.com. Uh, and I'll, you know, I send out emails a few times a year with when I have new videos or upcoming shows. Uh, every year, for example, uh, Every year, for example, I run the humor session at the annual meeting of the American Economic Association. Uh, and uh, I always like to say that you're all invited. So it's always in early January this coming year. It's going to be in New Orleans. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I always encourage folks, if you're interested in economics, I think they now have a bunch of the sessions that are also available by, by video feed. Um, you know, but if you're interested in economics, it's like an amazing conference. There's like 10,000 economists from all over the world who converge on one city for a long weekend, and it's just wild. I've got a couple more jokes that I can share with you, but first, why don't we stop here and see if there are any questions? So um, happy to take questions about economics, questions about making a living doing stand-up comedy, questions about climate change. So uh, Vaishnavi and Sonia, if it's okay, we'll do a, uh, do a Q and A for a few minutes and then I can tell some, a few jokes at the end to close it out. That sounds good. Um, thank you so much for that talk. I found it really interesting and I was laughing throughout. Um, uh, we have a bunch of questions in the Q and A box. So I'll just get started with the question and answer session. Um, the first question that we have is, what has been the biggest challenge that you've faced when you've tried to use comedy to explore economics? The biggest challenge using comedy to explore economics. Uh, there are some things that are not all that funny. So like the macro principles are all translated as blah, 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 because I couldn't think of a, like a really funny translation for them. Um, so that certainly is a challenge. Like there are some topics that are just kind of impenetrable as perhaps you have learned in the classroom as well. Uh, so, you know, there's a big difference between making people laugh for 30 minutes or 60 minutes with jokes about economics and, you know, teaching a, a, a class for a whole semester or a year or whatever. Um, so I think that's, um, those are some challenges. Uh, let me think other challenges, you know, I think people initially think that there's nothing funny about economics. Um, and on the one hand, that's a challenge because, you know, people kind of think like, oh, should we hire the stand-up economist? Like, what's that going to be about? Uh, on the other hand, it means that I get the benefit of low expectations, right? Like when people hire me, generally they're like, oh, stand-up economist, like this is not going to be very good. Um, and that mean that makes it easier for me to be okay. Right, like um, I, I like to say that economists. One of the things that's great about being an economist is we get the optimism that comes from having low expectations. Right, like especially if you if you sort of go into it assuming that, and uh, you know we don't have to do this in economics, but in many cases we assume that you know firms are profit maximizing, individuals are self interested. Um, you could even think about them as selfish, and so when people behave better than that, right, like if your baseline is that people are always going to be mean and just look out for themselves all the time, people are actually much nicer than that. Right. So, you know, I like to say that, that, um, you know, if there are two elderly women who are crossing the street and this young, young punk comes up and knocks one of them down and steals her purse, right. Then the economist is the one who's like, Hey, look, the other one made it. So there are kind of these benefits that come from having low expectations. 
okay so the next question that we have is what prompted you to become an become a stand up economist since it's not a very conventional career path to take up yeah that's a fun question so um uh i went to graduate school to study environmental taxes and got my phd which i did at the university of washington in seattle um and then while i was in graduate school i wrote this parody of mancu's textbook uh, just to kind of blow off steam, because that's what you do when you're in graduate school. At least that's what I did when I was in graduate school. And one thing led to another. It got published in a science humor journal called the Annals of Improbable Research. Uh, they're the people that give out the Ig Nobel Prizes every year, which you may have read about. Um, and they also run a humor session at a science convention in the U.S., and it happened to be in Seattle. And so they invited me to present my paper, and I did. And I had so much fun, I kind of got into stand-up comedy as a hobby. And then after I finished my PhD, uh, two things happened. One was that my academic career did not go quite as well as I had hoped. So, um, you know, I had trouble getting my dissertation published. Um, I think it is only half of a joke to say that I'm probably the last person in the world to get a PhD in economics with a purely theoretical dissertation. So like I didn't have an econometric component to my dissertation. And as you probably know, the discipline has gone heavily in the direction of econometrics and statistics. And um, even though I'm a math undergrad, like I've never been, I've never been all that great about at, at econometrics. And I've never really, the sad truth is I've never been all that interested in it, right? I've been interested in environmental taxes and trying to make policy changes um, and implement good policy. And um uh, so my academic career did not go quite as well as I'd hoped. That was one thing that happened. And then the other thing that happened was I had a comedy video that got a million hits on YouTube and people started emailing me and asking if they could hire me to do stand-up comedy about economics. And I started saying yes. Uh, so it was partly that I, partly I, I, I jumped and partly I was pushed. That's so interesting. Um, the next question that we have is, since you've written several books at the intersection of comedy and economics, are there any challenges that you faced during the research process um, about, say, maintaining a balance between the comedic aspect of it and the academic writing aspect of it? Um, I'm not entirely sure about where this question is going, but I'll say a couple of things. I mean, I've written a couple, I've, I've done a little bit of academic work, um, but I'm not a great academic, right? Like I've spent my career trying to make money, enough money to, 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 you know, feed my family and to finance my activism activities. Um, and so I kind of focused on that and not so much on writing journal articles. And mostly that's, I think my explanation for that is, first of all, that it, perhaps it is not my comparative advantage. And second of all, that I just, I mean, when it comes to policies that I'm interested in, like carbon taxes, I just don't think that writing another cost benefit analysis showing that carbon taxes are a great idea is going to move the needle politically right like economists all think that carbon taxes are great the challenge is how do you get them through the political process um so i haven't done a ton of academic work i mean i've done a little bit um in terms of the cartoon books uh and i also have like a microeconomics textbook that's available free on my website that follows the same path as the as the cartoon micro book which i think is really it's I think it's a beautiful little path. So it starts off by, by you know, defining economics is about the interaction, the actions and interactions of optimizing individuals. And then the book and the cartoon book start off with a single individual. So you do, you know, optimization over time and optimization with uncertainty. And then there's strategic interactions between small numbers of individuals. And then that builds up to auctions and then ultimately to market interactions between large numbers of individuals. So I think that's a really neat sort of story, like individual optimization, strategic behavior between small numbers, and then market interactions between lots of people. Um, so the, you know, the, the challenge with the books, and this was something that my, so my co-author, uh, is also the illustrator, Grady Klein. Um, and it was really great to work with him because he sort of brought beginner's mind to the whole process where I was, I mean, I had a PhD in economics, so I can be like, la-di-da-di-da, -da, we're going to do whatever, you know, gains from trade or Pareto efficiency or whatever. And like, I mean, I've studied this stuff for years, so I know what it's all about, but he came at it with, well, you know, this is going too fast or it's too hard or we need to slow down or explain this differently. Um, and then we also need to explain it in a way that is going to keep people entertained, right? And I, and I think that one of the things that's challenging that we can forget as faculty members 
is the importance of motivating students, right? The importance of motivation. Like everybody has access to, well, everybody has access to everything on the internet now, but you have a 600 page textbook, right? The question is, are you going to open the 600 page textbook? And, uh, you know, I sometimes say that, that, you know, people will have a textbook like Mankiw's textbook, which is a $200 textbook, and then they'll buy my cartoon book for $12. And that's the book that they're actually going to read, right, is the cartoon book. Uh, so keeping it um, engaging and making people want to learn more is, I think, the, you know, that's what I kind of think of the goal as the cartoon books uh, as being. Um, I, I'm not going to say that they're a complete substitute for a 600 page textbook, but I think there's a lot of good stuff in it. And um, and I think it's establishing that motivation so that people wa want to go and learn more. Okay. Um, the next question is, what other issues regarding climate change are you working on right now? You know, that's about it. So, I, I mean, I work on mostly state level policy here in the United States. Um, there are a bunch of folks who work on federal policy. I mostly stay out of federal policy, um, partly just because, uh, you know, I'm only one person and there's only so much that I can do with my time. And most of the climate stuff that I do is, it's, I mean, it's kind of my hobby, right? Like comedy pays the bills. I do a little bit of teaching and consulting. And then I spend a bunch of my free time like working on climate issues. Um, and then I want to hang out with my family and my kids and stuff like that also. Um, so, but there are also, I mean, there are a lot of really good economists out there who work on federal policy. And, and so I think there are fewer economists who work on state level policy and especially very few economists who work on state level policy in kind of conservative leaning states like Utah and South Dakota and Nebraska. And so I really think that I have a value added there because oftentimes I'm I'm kind of the only person who's out there saying like, hey, here's a climate policy that could work in you know a really conservative state um, like Utah. Uh, so that's kind of that's you know I I try to stay on top of um, what's happening nationally, what's happening internationally, um, but for the most part I, I I focus on state level policy. Um, in relation to the question you just answered uh, what has been the general reaction of um, say everyday people to the policy of carbon taxes and not just the policy makers what do normal people think about carbon tax uh, normal people don't like carbon taxes all that much <laughs> so so the i mean folks on the street you know i, I think what's interesting about it is first of all um the way that economists think about taxes is totally different than the way that folks on the street think about taxes, right? Like economists, we talk about deadweight loss and efficiency and stuff like that. And folks on the street don't think about it like that. They think about it in terms of fairness and how much do I pay and uh, things like that. Um, and carbon taxes are hard, I think, partly because for whatever reason, uh, people are very attentive to the price of things like motor gasoline. Um, you know, like a tax on motor gasoline that raises a dollar is for some reason is like harder than a tax on, you know, furniture that raises a dollar. Um, so there's a lot more, I guess, salience, you'd call it. Uh, and then I, there's also people don't, people think that elasticities are always zero. So when you say like, hey, we're going to have a carbon tax, so everybody will have an incentive to reduce emissions, then the response is, well, I have to drive, like I have to heat my home, I, you know, and there's no, um, there's no recognition really that people can make changes, and people have, you know, people do make changes, like gas is a lot more expensive now than it was, you know, a couple of years ago, and you know, you can drive slower, you can keep your tires inflated, you can carpool, you can work from home, like everybody has choices. Um, and ways that they can respond to these policies um, and re and reduce emissions, but people don't like to think about that. People for, for people on the street tend to think, well, you know, I have to I have to do X. I have to do the the same thing that I've been doing. Um, and then I think there's, I mean, with the so so that's why carbon taxes are hard, and that's why like the policy I'm working on in Utah, what we we're focusing on local air pollution issues because that's something that people care about. And we're focusing on eliminating the state sales tax on grocery store food because people don't want to pay taxes on grocery store food either. They think that's really unfair. 
And so I think the challenge for Utah voters, assuming we get this on the ballot, is like, well, you know, which do they want? Which do they want more or which do they want less, right? Like, are you willing to take a tax on fossil fuels uh, in order to eliminate the sales tax on groceries and pay for some clean air programs? And um, uh, I think we have a shot at it, right? I mean, if we can get, we need to, we need to get, uh, I think, a prominent Republican like Senator Mitt Romney or some former governors who care about climate change and care about air pollution to say that this is an important, a good policy and a good step forward. Um, so I, I think if we can do that, then I think we have a chance. But um, but I think the, the the point behind the question maybe is certainly well taken, which is that carbon taxes are hard. Uh, we'll just take one last question for the night. Um... So someone said that they really loved your breakdown of the principles and that it made their evening. Um, have you ever collaborated with someone who might operate within the same sphere of economics and humor? And if so, how did it turn out? Uh, so I run the, I, I, co, I co-host the humor session at the annual meeting of the American Economic Association. Uh, as I mentioned, and usually like there's a bunch of economists. So we haven't done it for a couple of years because of COVID. Um, but in the past when we've done it, uh, it, it there's been a, a bunch of other uh, economists who come and, and uh, do routines. And that's been really fun. Like I'm the only one who's sort of a, I'm the only one who's actually makes a living doing stand-up comedy about economics. Uh, but the others, um, like they're fun. There was a fellow who came and he, like he plays the piano and sings songs about economics. And, um, uh, you know, and sometimes, sometimes folks bomb, like they don't, Sometimes they don't do all that well, but everybody has a good time anyway, and it's usually a packed house, and and we have a fun time. Do we have a couple? Should I tell a couple jokes to to close off the night? Sure. All right. Um, and and uh, thanks to Vajnavi and Sanya for inviting me to do this, and uh, I hope you all have uh, in, enjoyed the evening. So as I as I mentioned, I mean, you can one reason why you can do comedy about economics. Uh, is that people have very strong stereotypes about economists, you know, kind of economists are hyper rational and kind of money focused. And so I have a bunch of you might be an economist if jokes. Um, so you might be an economist if you're an expert on money, but you dress like a disaster victim. Uh, you might be an economist if you think that America's next top model should be an endogenous growth model with technological change. Uh, you might be an economist uh, if you don't read human interest stories because they don't interest you. You might be an economist if you've ever gone to a bank or other financial institution in the hopes of getting a date. If you plan to have your children born in December instead of January so that you can maximize the discounted present value of the child tax credit. You might be a macroeconomist if you think the chicken crossed the road because of a series of unexpected developments in global financial markets. You might be a game theorist if you're an expert on poker, but you've never actually played a hand. You might be an environmental economist if you spend a lot of time flying around the world, telling people that we need to spend less time flying around the world. Uh, you might be an economist um, if you adamantly refuse to sell your children because you think they'll be worth more later. Uh, and finally, oh, this is a hard one, but I'll try it on you all. Uh, you might be an economist if you read your fortune cookie out loud in a Chinese restaurant and you put at the margin at the end of it. So I have to explain that joke a little bit tell you why it's difficult. So in the US at Chinese restaurants, there are fortune cookies, which are little cookies that have little pieces of paper with fortunes in them. Uh, and in the US, at least when you read your fortune cookie out loud at a Chinese restaurant, the joke is that you're supposed to put in bed at the end of what's on your fortune cookie. So like hard work will be richly rewarded in bed. And then, the, you know, everybody laughs and the next person reads their fortune cookie. People who know that about Chinese restaurants are sort of, sort of over here on the Venn diagram. This is a joke about Venn diagrams. And if you think about people in the world who know what at the margin means, those people are sort of over here on the Venn diagram. And those two parts of the Venn diagram, like they don't really overlap much at all. Uh, one of the times that I really struggled doing economics comedy, my father is now retired in, in San Francisco. Every Tuesday, he goes hiking with a group of fellow retired German immigrants. And the last time I was out visiting him, he sent an email to his hiking group and said, my son is coming on our next hike and we'll be providing free comedy at lunchtime. So there I was in Mill Valley telling economics jokes to like eight elderly German women, and they were a tough crowd, and I didn't do very well. But maybe because I wasn't doing very well, I figured I would tell this joke about the fortune cookie that rarely works. 
So I told this joke about the fortune cookie and you wouldn't believe it, it didn't work. But maybe because there was something in our shared German heritage, this woman, woman came up to me afterwards and insisted that I explain the joke to her, you know, so that she could understand why it was funny. And what followed was really this amazing cultural experience because I had to spend 10 minutes telling her about economics and at the margin. And then I had to spend 10 minutes telling her about Chinese restaurants and fortune cookies and in bed. And like after 20 minutes, I think she finally gets it until I hear her say, as she turns to walk away with her hiking companion, she says something that I think is pretty much a tagline for the 21st century. She turns to walk away with her friend and she says, I still think that joke is about computers. Thanks again for inviting me to join you. I hope you all uh, have a great rest of the year. Thank you, sir, for making time in your schedule for this incredible session. Uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to host you, and we enjoyed learning about your unique endeavor to use the comedy genre to highlight topical themes like climate change. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining and making this an interactive session. The recording of the webinar will soon be shared with all of you. Lastly, thank you to all the members of the Economic Society who helped make this event a success. We hope you all have a wonderful week ahead. Bye, everyone. Good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.